It was some time ago, I was relaxing in the bathtub, sort of, you know, minding my own business. And um, out of nowhere, a still small voice whispered two words. Wrong button there. Unusual attitudes. Let's pray. Dear Father, you know where each of us are in our station in life just now and in this world. You know what's coming in the days ahead. You know what we will need. And I just pray that you will speak to each of us today. Let not the human voice interfere with anything you want to, um, to convey to us. May your still small voice speak to each of us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, unusual attitudes, those are two curious words. They, they probably mean something special to you if you happen to be a, a parent with teenagers. <laughs> or conversely, it might mean something a little different to you if you happen to be a teenager with parents. Whatever. Well, if, if you've ever taken flying lessons, learned how to fly an airplane, then these two words, unusual attitudes, mean something special to you. It's a specific training exercise to train the student pilot to not rely on his own physical senses, but to uh, rely and trust in the gauges and the instruments that are on the, the panel in front of him in the airplane. So, plane, airplanes fly in three dimensions of space, and if you bear with me, I, I brought a visual aid this morning. And, and so planes go up and down and fly level on what is called there the lateral axis. They can roll to the left or roll to the right on what is the longitudinal axis. And then they can kind of veer uh, left or right, uh, which is what yaw, the word yaw means. And that's on the, on the vertical axis. And so oftentimes planes are, are flying within all three of those dimensions. Let's say, for instance, a climbing turn or, or a descending turn. Uh, the Christian experience is something like that. We move in three spiritual dimensions, the, the dimension of the study and meditation of God's word. We uh, move in the dimension of prayer and we also move in the dimension of, of sharing our faith with another. All three of these dimensions are, are well familiar to us. So the, uh, the point of flying an airplane, if you want to get from point A to point B, the uh, most direct way, of course, would be straight and level. And the pilot has a gauge that will show him that. That's an artificial horizon. And right now, what it is displaying is straight and level flight. Um, the Christian life, if you want to get from where we are right here, right now, to heavenly places, we need to follow the straight and narrow path, don't we? This is what... Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and bear with me, I can't see the screen behind you very well. So uh, he said, enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate 
and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Does that show up on the screen okay for you? Yes. All right, good. I'm going to reconfigure here. Bear with me. Oops, yeah, we're going here. Okay. So this is the goal of the Christian life, to, to walk the straight and narrow path. And Jesus said there's few that would find it. Well, we want to be among the few, don't we? So, flying an airplane requires discipline. You learn the skill of monitoring your gauges and instruments uh, constantly, as, along with what you see outside in the sky outside the airplane. But you, you want to know what the plane is doing pretty much at all times. So you learn how to scan the, those those gauges. Uh, the Apostle Paul explained to us that the Christian life also involves a discipline, does it not? He said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And you know, if you didn't catch uh, Paul's words, maybe you would catch Peter's in chapter 4 and verse 7 of his first letter, he said, The end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. If the end of all things was at hand in, in Peter's time, what do you think about today? We are so much closer to the end of all things, and so it behooves us to be sober and to watch unto prayer. So um, this specific exercise that the student pilot goes through that's called unusual attitudes, it involves the student wearing this contraption on his head. It's just called a hood. As you can see, it shields his eyes so he can't see what is happening outside the airplane. Uh, at at this point where he is sitting, the student pilot could, could see the gauges. But the, um, the whole object is to not trust your physical senses. The object is to trust what the gauges are telling you. I had one instructor that had kind of a devious mind, you know. Um, when we were going through this unusual exercise business, he would take he would take control of the plane. I was wearing a, a, a hood like that and looking down at my feet. I could not see the instrument panel. I could not see outside the plane. So he'd take the control and he would so gradually bank that plane into a turn that my sense of balance could not pick that up. You know, my inner ear was said, I'm, I'm going straight and level. Well, then suddenly he would return to straight and level and say, look up. And to look up, and what do you think I did? You immediately go back into that bank turn because your senses are telling you that, uh, that you were that you were not straight and level, when in fact you were. It was a um, it was a good lesson that uh, when when you think that you know what the plane is doing, perhaps you really don't. Some of you will remember the uh, son of President John F. Kennedy. He was a, a pilot, an amateur pilot. He was not qualified to fly on instruments alone. He had to fly visually, and so he was 
trying to get to a destination where there was overcast. He could not see the sky, the horizon, or the ground beneath him. And so gradually went into a dive, imperceptibly went into a dive and wound up in the ocean. That's the danger for us as Christians. Um, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24, Jesus tells us this, that there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and they'll show us great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Very elect, that's you and me. We don't want to be deceived, do we? So Paul admonishes us in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that we hereafter should be no more children. We should be grown-up Christians, right? Uh, not tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So, it's important for us to know our gauges, right? We need to know what this book tells us. We need to know what that still small voice says to us. We need to know that when we are asked to give a word of the reason of the belief that lies within us, that we can do so truthfully, but with meekness and fear. Are you a satisfied Christian this morning? Well, I share with you words that appeared at the top of the editorial page of the Denver Post. I lived there for a period of years, and this is what it said. There is no hope for the satisfied man. The point is, don't be satisfied with your present Christian experience. Hunger and thirst for more and more. What we read these words from the Lord's servant in book uh, testimonies, volume 4, page 560. None are in greater danger than he who feels that his mountain stands sure. It is then that his feet will begin to slide. Temptations will come one after another, and so imperceptible will be their influence upon the life and character that unless we are kept by divine power, by study, by prayer, and by sharing, uh, we will be corrupted by the spirit of the world and will fail to carry out the purpose of God. And so Paul admonishes us again in a different way. He says to us, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Be careful, be vigilant, watch and pray is what he's saying. Well, there's another type of unusual attitudes. The flight instructor would take this plane You'd be looking down at your feet, and you'd go up and down and twist and turn and, and all kinds of things. Sometimes he'd reach uh, the plane to the point of where, uh, in, in flying terms, is called a stall, where uh, there's not enough lift to, to support the plane, and so it's going to go nose down. Uh, other times, you know, you do the same thing, and then he'd, he'd bank into a turn where you're about, about to turn into a spin. And he'd tell you, look up, and you have to recover. Sometimes you, you don't know which way is up. And, uh, and that's the point. So 
Um, the Apostle Peter has these words for us in his first letter, chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. That we as Christians are, are kept by the power of God through faith to salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice. Are you rejoicing today that our salvation is almost ready to be revealed? I hope you are. Uh, though now for a season, there's the caveat. We don't rejoice so much with what's coming. Uh, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and glory, uh, honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the Christian life at times is a turbulent life. There are two of our family that are not here today. Just within the past week, their lives have been literal, almost literally turned upside down. And they are people that desperately need our prayers, our encouragement. Um, some of you, many of you, going through trials that are not pleasant, they can be painful, they can be uh, emotionally draining or, or wrenching. Well, here's the, here's the thing. In this little book called Steps to Christ, on page 80, we read these words. Encountering opposition and trials will drive you to the Bible and prayer. It'll drive you to the Christian's instrument panel. You will grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ and will develop a rich experience. We'll be drawn closer to Jesus than, than if we had never had this, this trial. We need to come to place in our, in our experience where we can echo the words of Job. In chapter 13 and verse 15, he says, Though he slay me, Yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. Now, why would Job be confident in his own ways? Well, he says later in chapter 23 and verse 10 that the Lord knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So it is for you and me. We're tried in the fire so that the gold of our faith can be purified and, and refined and can reflect the, the pure gold of, of the character of, of Christ. Well, there was a summer that I had, uh, that I spent a time in Chicago uh, going to a flying school to get my instrument rating. Now, I flew in a little plane like that, and, uh, and I was assigned the instructor, and I won't tell you his, his name, but his last name rhymed with his nickname. His nickname, The Flying Fool. And so in this school, you learn how to, how to file a flight plan. You learn how to receive a, a clearance from, from the tower, very specific instructions. You learn how to repeat that back to the control tower. And then you learn how to fly without the visual aid of, of the sky outside of you. You learn to fly just on what the instruments and the navigational aids are telling you. Well, as it turned out, one day, there was a thunderstorm that was approaching Chicago. And, and all the flight instructors said, we're gonna, stay, we're gonna stay down today. This doesn't look good. All of them, except for one. Yep, you guessed it. 
We filed that flight plan, we took off, and we headed right for that thunderstorm. Just me and the flying fool. Let me tell you, we did not conquer that storm. We survived it. We were bounced around like a leaf in the wind. There were updrafts and downdrafts where in a blink of an eye, you were 500 feet higher or lower than, than you were. We got through that storm and, and I learned under severe trial that day that uh, the importance of relying on what your gauges are telling you. From the book Confrontation, page 93, we have characters to form here, right here, right now. God will test us and prove us by placing us in positions to develop the most enduring strength, purity, and nobility of soul with what kind of patience? Perfect patience on our part and what kind of trust? Entire trust in a, in who? In a crucified Savior. We shall meet with reverses, affliction, and severe trials, for these are God's tests. And my favorite author then quotes part of Malachi chapter 3. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and purge his people as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. This doesn't sound all that pleasant, does it? Does Jesus understand the unusual attitudes that we are cast into? Well, consider for a moment. This is God manifest in the flesh kneeling at that rock. He was self-existent. He is co-eternal, one with the Father, one with the Spirit, in community of selfless giving. And he willingly chose to be manifest in the flesh so that we could learn the truth about God, his love for us, so that he could take upon his person the sins of the world. This was foreign to his person. It was abhorrent. It was repulsive, repugnant. And if that's not bad enough, it caused separation between him and his father, something that throughout all eternity past and for all eternity future, Jesus and the father would never know. This was the mother of all unusual attitudes right there in this garden that in the Aramaic is called olive press. And he did it because he's not willing that any of us miss out on eternal life, of the joys of heaven, of life on a new earth where there is no suffering and sorrow and death. He did it for us. Well, these are familiar words to many of you. Volume 9 of the Testimonies and page 11. 911. What a coinky dinky, huh? Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final ones will be rapid ones. Just, just 
pause for a moment. Think about life over the past three years. Did any of you anticipate all of this? Do any of you think, well, this is, this is just normal life. This is the way it is. No. These are great changes that we are in the midst of. And we're watching final movements taking place with a rapidity that makes our head want to spin. Isn't that right? So what do we do? Do we hunker down? Do we go into all-out self-defense mode? Or do we buckle up and go into all-out trust in him who has engraved your names on the palms of his hands? You have a choice in the matter. But it won't be, tomorrow won't be any better than it is today. And the day after tomorrow won't be any better than tomorrow. And the day after that and so on. We read these words in the book, The Great Controversy, page 622. The Lord did not leave us clueless as to what is coming. He has given us a a foretaste, a foreknowledge, so that we can develop an abiding trust in him, an unshakable trust. The time of trouble, such as never was, is soon to open upon us. And we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, and which many are too indolent to obtain. What does that word indolent mean? So we're we're careless, we're, we're, we're flippant, we're unobservant. It's often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. Do you understand what the Lord's servant just told us? Picture in your mind how bad things can get and, and, and you're not even there. So, can you trust yourself? Or can you trust the Lord Jesus? From the same volume and a page back, God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. Amen. Our earthliness must be consumed. It means all the sad and silly little things that we love so much in our daily routines, um, the things that the world has to offer, entertainment, sports, news. How much, of, how much of any of that is going to get us to heaven? No. When the last vestige of everything that would hold us here is purged from us, then the Lord can catch us up and take us home. Amen. So, what is the flight plan of the Christian? Hmm? We already read it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
and lean not unto your own understanding. Rely not on your own senses. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So don't be wise in your own eyes. Our wisdom is foolishness to God. Don't let his wisdom be foolishness to, to us. Fear the Lord, reverence him, worship him, acknowledge him as your creator, as your redeemer, as the lover of your soul, and depart from evil. That's our flight plan. As we wind down, I want to share with you an experience I had Again, in my, in my college days, it was a cold, damp, dreary winter morning in the upper Midwest. The sky was overcast. It just looked luck. And I got on board a commuter plane, small one, you know, less than 20 passengers. And so we take off headed south as we climb through that overcast we break th through the overcast and and then it looked like we were just skimming along the surface of a sea of, of whipped cream the the sky was just a deep rich blue it was early morning no sun yet, but you could see little wisps of cirrus clouds in the sky above. They were, they were painted a, a beautiful pastel orange by this phenomenal artist that paints a sunrise and a sunset for us. And then, as I'm watching, the sun came up above the horizon of this overcast, and it was a huge, beautiful orange ball. So here we are, skimming on this sea of whipped cream, this beautiful orange ball there, and in a beautiful blue sky, and I'm just loving it. It was so different from what it was on the ground before I got in, in that plane. If I can find it quickly enough, I'm going to skip through the next reference that I had. And I want to share with you the words of Paul from Romans chapter 8. And, and please forgive me, I'm not reading this from King James. This is from the New Living Translation. Romans chapter 8, and I'm beginning at verse 15. So, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now, we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins, his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Does his spirit tell your spirit right now that you are God's child? I hope it does. I really, truly hope it does. Reading on, since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, Together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. 
All creation is waiting to see us emerge against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. That time is coming, friends. It's coming. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. What happens with labor pains? They start, they start mild, noticeable, but mild now. <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience, okay? <laughs> but somewhat mild and spaced apart, uh, it, it's strong enough to let you know, oh, something's happening and the space of time in between contractions gets closer and closer and the contractions get stronger and stronger this is the imagery that Paul is using here he says for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time and we believers also grown, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Is that what you're longing for this morning? It's what I'm longing for, to be released from that. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as our adopted, as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Ooh, I like that. We were given this hope when we were saved. And if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it, do we? But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently, right? He that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This mortal will put off mortality and put on immortality, it, and all of you will too. So we know our flight plan. We know the dimensions that we navigate through this world of sin, right? To study and meditate on the word of God like never before. To pray and commune with God like never before, to share with your family, your friends, your loved ones, your neighbors, your co-workers, the person in line at the store in front of you, like never before, Life in this world is about to get turned upside down. You know it, and I know it. But we have a God that also knows it and has promised to navigate us through this and bring us safely home. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, your grace is, is too amazing for words. It is something that we need to experience in our own lives for ourselves. Father, we just pray that as we go forward here, today, tomorrow, the next day, the day after that, 
that we will draw closer to you, that we will trust what your word tells us, that we will trust what your still small voice and your ever faithful guardian angels will whisper to us. And that as we share your love and your word of truth in this dying world, that we will be on a straight and narrow path that will lead us to the place that you can catch us up and take us home. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.